Okay. Um, to set us off in style this afternoon, um, a lady who is really very, very passionate indeed. Um, I remember speaking to her for the first time on the phone. She's like, yeah, we're going to change the world. And I totally believed it. So um, there's so much going on. She's prepared to challenge your thinking. So get ready for that. Um, and it's really influencing change when it comes to uh, the workforce around our sector. So please welcome Tara Dillon, who is Chief Exec for Simspa, even. <laughs> Absolutely no pressure then. <laughs> uh, check, challenge and change. Right. Um, before I get going, how many people have heard me speak before? Oh, that's okay. Uh, how many people um, work in further or higher education? Excellent. And how many are in uh, sport? And how many are in health and fitness and leisure? Okay, right audience then. I just thought I'd check. Okay, now I, I'm going to start with a piece of audio. It was a video, but we can't get the video and the audio to work at the same time. So I thought the video without audio would be pants. So I've gone with the audio. Um, now I need to set the scene because you really have got to listen. And this, uh, this is from Mock the Week. You've probably seen Mock the Week. It's one of these kind of newspaper. Uh, comedy programs and they address sort of uh, news stories in the week and then a bunch of comedians just take the mickey out of it and that's it essentially and um, this talks about Dara Breen raises something that's been in the news about universities and exam boards letting students down um, and then he asks the panels okay so have you heard about this what is it okay so you'll, you'll hear a guy say, yes, I think it's this. What I want you to listen for is Mickey Flanagan's voice. Mickey Flanagan, the Cockney comedian. I want you to listen to what Mickey... I love Mickey Flanagan, I think it's hilarious, but I want you to listen to what he says. Oh, hang on. I'm putting my thumb up. It's on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Looks so cool, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, have a listen, utter silence, because you hear laughter to start off with, but listen to Mickey Flanagan. In other news, how have exam boards let down to students this week? By asking questions that are unanswerable. What manner are they unanswerable? They didn't have enough information in them. The papers, there are typos or mistakes on the paper. Yeah. Yes. One, of, one of the sports science papers was a really tough one. It said, uh, name. <laughs> almost impossible to turn off as well. So do you get that? Yeah? Have we got the doofers? Do they work? Yep. Okay, get your doofers out. <clears throat> Just press one. If that statement, so I heard about a sports science exam the other day, had a really tough question on it, it was name. If that annoys you, press one. How do you know? It should come up on the screen, but if it's not a pre programmed question, it may not. So we will oh, okay. Wait Put your hands up if that annoys you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Hey, no more tech for me, just talking now. <laughs> Bloody hell. I'm going to turn, turn that off in case, you know, my dad phones. Leaves a voice alone. You've got to listen to that. There you go. Right. So it is a bit annoying, right? Why is it annoying? Anybody want to shout out why that's annoying? It's not true. It's not true. Anything else? Devalues the industry. Yeah, it, it does. Anything else? Offensive. It is offensive. Yeah. How many people have got a sports science degree? How do you spell your name? Oh. There you go. <laughs> right. So. It's, it's degrading, it's offensive, it's unfair, but you laughed and the audience laughed, which suggests there's a perception out there that we're a bit thick, right? So I've told this story a few times, um, and I'm going to say it again. There's, this is a, a pub scenario, and it does happen. Me and Yvonne talked about it the other week. Um, if I go to a pub on a Friday night, which is ever so infrequent, uh, and I meet somebody I don't know, okay? A gang of people. 
and somebody says, well, what do you do? It starts off quite well because I've got the, the, you know, the fancy CEO title. So I say I'm a CEO. Oh, oh. that sort of reaction. Of what? A chartered institute. Now, half the audience are not in a profession and the other half are. So half the audience haven't got a clue what I've just said and the other half are still kind of, oh. In what? Sport and physical activity. Then what happens? I either get, no. <laughs> or, show us your bicep. <laughs> Honestly, is that, does that sound true yeah. to you? Okay? Now, if I were giving a lecture this morning, it's not a lecture, I'm not in university, it feels like it, but if I were giving a presentation on a lecture on how to deliver a presentation, I would not start by winding up your audience and getting them all angry about being belittled uh, and degraded by public perception, but it is something that I am desperately, desperately passionate about changing because I think we are an incredibly professional bunch of people I just don't think we've been validated yet. So let's have a look at that statement at the top here. So the Chartered Institute, your Chartered Institute, developed by you, built by you, backed by you, got government back in a couple of years ago <clears throat> and said, we would like to see this. Does anybody see an issue with that statement? It's not terrible. Who said that? Who said that? Increased professionalisation. And when you drill down and you look into that document, it says Simsma's task is to professionalise this sector. Now, I take issue with that a little bit. I would prefer, given what we've just heard and what I've just explained, that, we, that Simsma's task with you guys is to be seen as a profession, to be understood as a profession, um, for graduates to see this as a fantastic place to work with great careers before them. But we have got some work to do. We've definitely got some work to do. My brother, my, my niece, she's 14. We come from a big sporty family. Um, and my niece, when she was younger, couldn't catch a ball. My brother and I were quite worried about it, thinking, well, what's happened to the Dylan Jean? She couldn't catch anything, right? As she's got older, she's got into sport. She just got a scholarship at Cheltenham College, full scholarship. Um, she's 14 years old and just been selected for the under-16 England team. Okay, awesome. She can catch, it turns out. Um, so we're very, very proud of her. And Simspa is based at Loughborough University, which is a fabulous place, as you know. Um, and she's asked if she can come up and have a look at Loughborough, because England netball play there a lot, and it's, you know, a pretty good sports university. Um, look, I'm trying not to catch the eye of anybody from Loughborough. It's an excellent sports university. Um, and my brother said, mm, I want her to be good at sport, but I'm not sure I want her to work in your sector. My own brother said that to me. And he said, because, and he said, it start off, it was about pay, and we addressed that one, we talked about that. But the other one is, he said, I can't describe what she'll do. And I said, I did look at him. Luckily, I'm her auntie, so perhaps I can, you know, so kind of forgotten what I do for a living. Thanks, Colin. But do, do you see what I'm saying? That's in my own sphere. That's in my own environment, that, that the sports sector is not understood. That professionals, and I'm looking at a big crowd of professionals now in our sector, are viewed as people who get about in a shorts and T-shirt and blow a whistle. Yeah? So this is what the whole purpose of Simpsons function is. So <clears throat> I'm just going to... Where's my clicker? There it is. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've done. Um, and, and if you, does this work? Yeah, it does. If you look down here, this is kind of what SIMSPA stands for. This is what we're creating. This is the bedrock um, to encouraging prof this as to be seen as a profession going forward. But there are some challenges in front of us. And I think uh, there's been a bit of a golden thread today around collaboration. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about um, in the next sort of 30 seconds because I've made the intro go on for too long. This stuff here is the bedrock. So what we're suggesting is that in order to get everybody in our sector aligned 
and understood, there are some foundations that we need to put in place. And those foundations are called professional standards. So there's a whole plethora of qualifications and, and diplomas and degrees um, being created, and they have been created over the last 20 years through lack of any sort of professional body. And some is very good, and some is not so good. So if, as a sector, we can come together and say, OK, to become a personal trainer or to become a coach or to become a performance director, the minimum standards required for that qualification are, and then get universities and colleges and training providers and awarding organisations to say, we can map to those standards, we deliver to that level, and get a kite mark from Sinstra that says that we're going to do it. It then means that the people coming into our sector in the future, or the people within our sector who want to grow, can do so consistently. You as employers can employ somebody with a qualification that you know is worthy of a kite mark. You get to input into that. The whole process is completely and utterly operator, employer, HE-led. You get to make the decisions about what a coach qualification looks like, what a performance director looks like, what a sports development manager looks like, um, what a PT, a fitness instructor, a lifeguard, etc. Um, you shape those standards and we give it the kite mark. So all that work has been done. That was the, that was the foundation that we've been working on for the last couple of, couple of years. And if you look at the mandate, if you look at everything that we've heard today, we've got backing from Sport England, we've got backing from government, we've heard, heard some fantastic stuff this morning about children's activity, about collaboration, Masses and masses of stuff. I get stuff thrown at me every day, you know, digital disruption, social prescription. It's brilliant what we're doing. It's absolutely brilliant. And we're getting ahead of the curve and we are going to make a difference. But when was the last time we stopped and said, now, who have we got delivering on that? When was the last time I changed, I checked my workforce against so, uh, social prescription or digital disruption? When did I check whether or not I have a workforce that even understands that or is qualified to take that forward? And then to look at it in a much broader way. There's another reason our, our sector is, is going through a bit of a sketchy patch at the minute, and that's because of scandals that are breaking around sport. Very, very small, small bunch of people discrediting an entire profession, and yet what do the papers say? So there's much, much, this is, this much has a much more bro broader base. So I'll talk to you about how that manifests in a second. This resource imbalance is important. So this is the mandate. Everybody is saying, can sport and physical activity improve the health and well-being of an entire nation and reduce the NHS bill? It's pretty much what we're being looked, uh, asked to do, amongst other things. Can we deal with the rising level of obesity in children? Um, can we reduce the number of, and so it goes on. The, the, the ask is very, very big. And yet from a training spend, let me tell you what we've done for years. So we spend around about uh, 112 million in apprenticeships as a sector each year, and about 113 million in applied general learning, so uh, uh, A-level PE, um, and BTEC, uh, sorry, others, uh, diplomas and, and sports courses at college. Um, and then we spend about 600 million in higher education, sports science, sports management, sports development, and so on. Um, and then what we do is we t take that student and we start them right down at the bottom here, give them a red and a yellow uniform, pay them minimum wage, and then spend 400 million as a sector retraining them. That's 1.1 billion pounds a year. So what we're saying to the Department of Education, the Department of Culture, Media, and Sport, is we don't want more money. What we want to do is as a profession, get more bang for our buck. And then make sure that the, all of those standards that I've just alluded to over here turn into something around status. So that when I graduate from a university, I am a chartered practitioner in physical activity. I am a chartered coach. I am a chartered sports development manager. That chartership, that's something that we've created as a sector, then becomes synonymous with the healthcare professionals that we're going to be working alongside. Accountants, lawyers, doctors, etc. So Mickey Flanagan never, ever gets away with that joke again. Because when I look at the calibre of the workforce that we have, it really is credit and validation that we're talking about here rather than reinventing the wheel. 
So let me just talk to you. So there's the mandate. Nobody disagrees with the why. So I want to give you a bit of a vision, okay? So there's lots of logistics here. Um, and I think I've talked a lot in the past about what we needed to put in place. Well, that's in place now. But So let's look at that vision. So let's imagine a world where we do have chartered activity practitioners working alongside healthcare practi practitioners uh, with a patient. We have chartered coaches running our sports rather than a bloke who's done it for a long time. Okay, and I'm not being disparaging to blokes who've done, or women who've done it a long time, but where's the credit for it? If I'm a great coach and I've got a great track record and I've been doing it for years and Yvonne qualifies tomorrow, we have equal status. Where's my recognition? Why don't I get a chartership? Why don't, why don't we validate ourselves? Why don't we back ourselves as a sector? Imagine a world where a graduate is absolutely employable the day he or she chucks a hat up in the air. Imagine that, and we're not retraining them, and we're not giving them the lowest job possible in the sector. Imagine a world where a parent can look up on a directory a coach to check whether or not he or she is safe, qualified, and competent to look after my kids on Saturday morning at the tennis lesson. Imagine where schools can tap into a database that checks that. That's what a chartered body does. That's what a profession like ours needs. And we've set it up together. What I'm asking for today is that we collaborate on this as a whole. So there are lots and lots of successful examples. Universities, for example, we're working with 12 universities at the moment. It could have been 80 who are absolutely bending over backwards to support this chartered institute to ensure that the standards that we've written can be embedded into degrees and that we link those graduates with employers so that they walk into a job or they've done an internship day one of graduation. Imagine that, attracting retaining talent instead of Mickey Flanagan taking the mickey out of them, my brother advising my niece against a career in this sector or we're paying them a minimum wage to a, a technical job. So that's where we're going, that's the vision, that's the difference and imagine going to the pub on a Friday night and being asked, you work in sport and physical activity, how do I get involved? That's where I want to be. That's where I think we deserve to be. So the green bits, really, I'm going to rush through these because I forgot they were there. Um, <laughs> the green bits means that, that, that that work has been done, okay? All of the stuff that we said we were going to do for you as a chartered body has been complete. Um, and this is important. We've got commitment from government, we've got commitment from Sport England, which is great. Nobody, nobody's going to find me saying, oh, money from Sport England. <laughs> um, could have done with a bit more. <laughs> um, but this is about everybody in this room. This is about the supply chain. This is about everybody in this room standing up at the end and not clapping me because I managed to get my phone to work. This is about you guys clapping and backing yourselves and saying, yes, we've got to do this as a sector. Yes, we must have a prof professional body. And yes, I do want to read about this in the papers going forward. And I do want to sell this career, this sector, as a brilliant option for a career. So that's <coughs> the employer bit. I think I've just said that. But there's it, it's in capitals and bold. So there you go. It's another slide I forgot was there. Um, <clears throat> and this is how it feeds back. This is how this, is, this perpetual work um, will really raise the bar. If we can make membership something that becomes the norm when we employ people, are you a member of your chartered body? What it says to you as employers, I know that they've got suitable qualifications that have been quality assured and vetted, or a degree that's been quality assured and vetted, or rather than become a PT in your lunch hour online. And those qualifications and see all that CPD associated is kite marked by your professional body. And then we come up with a national register for coaches so that, that, so that we can say back to the public, this is a sector that's backed itself, that has been responsive and taken its responsibility for some of the very small stuff that we've been sweating over um, because we're a profession. That's how this continues to work. And that's when we get this balance absolutely right. So I've got two minutes, which is great, because I, um, I've run out of slides. <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, but that sustainability, and for us working as a sector together on workforce is essential. We must, and you're going to hear this from Simon and Gary now, and these two, these two people are awesome. We must, must be absolutely clear that when we're innovating, and when we're planning, 
and when we're doing all the groundbreaking stuff that you've heard today, that we've thought about the workforce that will do it. I have never met anybody, not one person yet in this sector, who has said no to is workforce your top priority. We've got great innovations, product innovations becoming our strength. We've got blue chip companies circling this sector because it is so, the growth in it and, and the power of it is fantastic. And yet when I talk to people about the buildings and the projects and the assets and the kit, I say, what's your most important and your most expensive part of your business formula? It is, without doubt, every single time, the people delivering it. So that's what this Chartered Institute means to do for you. If you are going to back it, come and talk to me. If you want to get involved, come and talk to me. But if you want to make an absolute difference and be classed as a professional, uh, I'm all ears and I'm going to stand up for you 100%. Thank you very much for your time.